Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Snowflake stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Snowflake stores customer data in the cloud. It helps companies store their data on one platform where it's easy to access and analyze. The company uses Amazon, Microsoft, and Google platforms to store their clients' data, but they are applying their own software solutions. Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud are by far the leader in cloud computing. But Snowflake is growing by a faster rate than anyone else, by far, because their software is incredibly fast, flexible, and user-friendly. The company is headquartered in Bozeman, Montana, and was founded in 2012. The stock trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Bursa, Mexican Bolsa, Vienna, Swiss, Sao Paulo, and Buenos Aires stock exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 82 billion market cap. They're trading at 267 a share and they have 306 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have positive free cash flow for the first time in a trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's negative every year. Revenue is a sales for the company and that grows from 100 million to 1 billion. Amazing growth, 10X. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to maintain their platform is their main cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that grew from 45 million to 618 million. Below that is our operating expenses. Marketing and research and development are big operating expenses for this company. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income, which is negative every single year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. Then below that is other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses, not part of the company's core operations. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is negative every year. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. The nine months ending 10-31-20 and 10-31-21, and the three months ending 10-31-20 and 10-31-21. So their revenue doubled from 159 million to 334 million. A bulk of their revenue is in the US, 265 million, but they do revenue outside the US, 68 million. It's very easy for a company like this to sell their product all around the world. Their main product makes up 93% of their revenue. That's storing data in the cloud, data analytics, and everything part of that product. Professional fees make up 7% of their revenue. This is consulting fees and training related to its platform. It costs them $121 million to generate the $334 million of revenue, so their gross profit is $214 million. Their gross margin is 64%. That's gross profit over revenue. The median in the industry is 61%, the average is 49%. So they are more profitable than most companies. The reason they have negative net income is because their sales and marketing are 191 million, research and development 116 million, and general and administrative is 64 million. So they have 371 million of operating expenses. So their operating loss is 157 million, a little better than last year of 169 million. So their net income is negative every time period. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. Since they have so many non-cash items on the income statement, they actually generate a positive cash flow in the trailing 12 months. So that's a really good sign. Their main non-cash item is stock-based compensation. This is when you pay employees with stock. It reduces your net income because it's an expense, 
but it doesn't affect cash flow because the company doesn't have to actually spend any cash. It just dilutes the shareholders. They don't spend that much in CapEx. The CapEx they do spend is mainly on their software. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they did squeak out a small positive free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. But it really doesn't matter what this number is. Just the fact that it was positive, even if it was a small negative, that would be a win. Because they're moving in the right direction. Their 2022 free cash flow will be much larger. And the growth gets more exaggerated as they pass through their break-even points and economies of scale set in. So they don't really issue much debt. They're mainly running the business on common stock. They added nearly $5 billion of common stock in 2021. This is the money they received when they IPO'd. This is the company's operating cash flows from their latest 10Q. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net loss that was negative $550 million. Then we have to add back all the non-cash items on the income statement. $15 million of depreciation, $27 million of amortization, and the big one is stock-based compensation, $459 million. And then we have to adjust for changes in working capital. So even though they reported a net loss, they actually generated $31 million of cash flow. That's why I feel operating cash flow is a better indicator of how the company's doing than net income. Because when you look at the income statement, there's a lot of accounting things going on. And unless you really understand financials, it might not give you the right picture of how the company's doing. Sometimes the opposite is true. The income statement may show a big gain, but the company's losing a lot of cash flow. But in this case, the income statement is showing a big loss, but they are generating a little cash flow. Last year, they had a net loss of $340 million and they lost 65 million of cash flow. This is the investing and financing sections from their statement of cash flows. The nine months ending 10-31-20 and the nine months ending 10-31-21. They invested 12 million in property and equipment, 8.6 million in capitalized software, 11 million in intangibles, so it looks like they acquired some companies. They purchased three billion of short-term investments and they received three billion from the sale or maturity of some of these investments. They had a cash outflow of $57 million in their investing section. Last year was a cash outflow of $875 million. In their financing section, they received $90 million from options and $52 million from common stock to their employees. Last year, they received over $4 billion from their IPO. And they also received half a billion from convertible preferred stock. Convertible preferred stock is debt that receives interest payments, but the holder of the debt can convert the debt to common stock at a predetermined price. But it's their option to convert it. They don't have to. This is the equity section on their 1031 balance sheet. They raised $6.8 billion from selling their business, and they lost $1.8 billion from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. $5 billion of equity, $200 million of debt. They're 96% equity, 4% debt. And I gave them the lowest whack on Finbox, 7.5%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated a little over three years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past 2024. That's 71 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $62 billion. We divide that by 306 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 203. They're trading at 268. So they're trading at a 32% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Their revenue is projected to increase 36%. Since they've grown by 10x since 2019, I increased their revenue 100% just up through 2024. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. The average company in their industry converts 36% of their revenue to free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 36%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. Even with this aggressive approach, I'm still coming out of the stock price lower than they're trading at at 203. It is really hard to value this company. And sometimes I buy stock that goes against the model because I just see the future of certain companies so strong that their stock price can only go up. At least that's how I feel. And this might be one of those companies. Simply Wall Street's valuation is 167. They're saying the stock is 60% overvalued. 25 analysts price this stock and the average price target was 390, the lowest 310, the highest 470. When you value a stock, you're saying 
how much it's worth, how much money that asset can generate. But when you price a stock, you're saying how much someone's willing to pay. Because sometimes people are willing to pay more for something than it's worth. Some things hold sentimental value, like a wedding ring or even a car. Same thing with a stock. Sometimes people are willing to pay more than it's worth. This is where the stock has been trading since the end of 2020 when it IPO'd. When a stock IPOs, there's usually a run up and then there's a big sell off. And some stocks keep selling off so they never recover, they'll keep coming down. In this case, investors realized this was a good company and they drove the stock price back up. And it looks like it did break through $400 at the end of 2020 and also a few months ago. I think where it's trading at now is more appropriate. I could see the stock getting down to 220, 230 at its bottom. That's just my guess. But wherever the bottom is, whether it's here or down here, it'll start running up again and I'm sure it's going to break through 500. A lot of the market is predicated on momentum. So once a stock starts going up, then more people jump into the stock because they want to be part of that ride. And when a stock starts going down, people start selling because they get scared. So stocks generally go up and down, up and down, but good stocks go up over time. So you'll see these ups and downs, but over time, the stock will go up. They grew their customer base 52% year over year. Each quarter of their total customers increases. They're at 5,400. And the number of customers that spend over a million dollars a year has gone up a lot, 128%, from 65 to 148. Their revenue growth year over year is 110%. Their revenue retention is 173%. Their numbers may be better than just about any other company I've ever seen. But obviously they cannot keep up this pace. So investors are pricing the stock as if they kept up this pace for five, six years which they may do, but if they do not maintain this pace, you'll see a big drop in the stock price. That's when you wanna jump in. And even if they do maintain this pace, there's still gonna be a drop in stock price, just not as steep. And the reason the stock drops, even if they maintain the pace, is because it's all priced in and people wanna take in their gains at some point. The stock has gone down 7% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 14% in that same time frame. The 52 week low is 185, the high is 405. And the stock is on a decline, trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. Three and a half million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 306 million shares outstanding, 219 million are on float, 69% are held by institutions, and only 2% of the shares are shorted. Their employee count has grown a lot. They currently employ 3,600 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company when they IPO'd, you'd be a little over $10,000 today. That's because they IPO'd at such a high price. This happened with Facebook. I bought Facebook at the IPO, and two months later, I was down 40%. I ended up selling after five years, and I made a 400% return. So you might have to wait a few years to get a nice return with this stock. But Facebook is a giant. I don't know if this company will be a giant, only time will tell. There's a lot more insider selling than buying, as you can see here. Every quarter, someone sells. 500,000 shares sold in this quarter, 760,000 in this quarter, and about 300,000 shares are purchased. So you can see lots of individuals sold. But when someone sells, you don't really know why they're selling. Maybe they're retiring. Maybe they wanna buy a house. Maybe they just have too much money in the company and they want to spread it around to other companies. But when someone buys, you know why they're buying because they think the stock price will go up. Icon IQ is the biggest shareholder. They're the ones who added 300,000 shares. Icon IQ owns 30 million shares, almost 10% of the company, then Redpoint, Altamita Capital, Morgan Stanley, and Vanguard. Institutions own 59% of the company, the general public 13%, insiders 9%, venture capital and private equity firms 7%, hedge funds 7%, public companies 3%, private companies 2%. So everybody and their mother owns this stock, it seems. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. They have a really high price to sales of 80. It used to be well over 100, but their stock price has come down a lot. And their price to book is 16. Let's look at their non-current assets. 1.2 billion of investments, 94 million of property and equipment, 184 million of leases. 
they only have 34 million of intangibles so most of their growth seems to be organic their current ratio is 4.5 so they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets four and a half times let's look at their current assets 900 million of cash 3 billion of short-term investments 250 million of accounts receivables 43 million of deferred commissions and 120 million of prepaid expenses let's look at their current liabilities 11 million of accounts payable this is how much money snow owes other companies 163 million of recruit expenses these are expenses the company has incurred but it hasn't paid it yet 25 million of operating leases and 750 million of deferred revenue so if a customer pays upfront for their service say they pay for a year up front then they have to carry that as a liability on their balance sheet and each month they pull from that liability and book the revenue onto their income statement they had a small positive free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and they have lots of working capital working capital's current assets minus current liabilities so the company is well funded the best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry there are 233 companies in the same industry as snow and these are the top 20 in terms of market cap snow does spend a little more on capex than the average company they pretty much have no debt they don't pay a dividend yet they just started generating positive free cash flow so it's lower than average they're the sixth largest company on this list 82 billion market cap the average is 9 billion and all their price multiples are worse than average these ratios should improve a lot over time their revenue is half of the average and the numerator for ROA and ROE is net income so that's negative so to summarize I have them trading at a 32 percent premium and this is one of the hottest stocks around the problem is so many people knew that it was hard to get a good deal on this stock but if they one day become a 500 billion market cap company then you could get a great deal if you buy it now but it definitely seems overvalued at this point but I wouldn't be surprised if the stock doubled this year I rank their free cash flows 3 out of 10 their revenue 9 out of 10 and their ratio is 1 out of 10 so let me know what you think give this video a like subscribe or comment below also if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below thanks for watching